Hello and welcome to this third lecture in which we'll be covering some common functions. So let us begin. I've opened up Jupyter Lab over here. So let me create a new notebook. So I'll select the kernel. You can select an octave kernel if you want to program in octave. You can select a Python kernel if you want to program in Python. Uh, Jupyter Labs provide uh, provides you a good environment to write scripts in both i'll be focusing more on python 3 in this particular session but you'll find the corresponding octave file also in the website so before starting uh, let us quickly define what this file is going to be so it's a it says it's a notebook on commonly used functions. So let us import uh, numpy as np. So there's a small bug in which I have to select the kernel again. So if I press shift enter, it evaluates the cell and it's done. So, okay. So let me create an array. So x equal to np dot array. Let me create minus two, one point five zero uh, half of np dot pi and np dot pi. So let me print out the elements. So let me print x. So these are the elements of the array we've just defined. It's a user defined array. So now suppose I want to find out the absolute value. So let me just go ahead and write x a. So x absolute equal to np dot abs of x. So let me then print what x is and then correspondingly let me print what x a is. So here uh, the negative the minus of 2 has been converted to plus 2. In fact uh, we can take a complex with number as well so 0 plus say 4j. So in numpy uh, complex numbers are usually represented by j rather than i and in electrical engineering as well this convention is followed so let me evaluate this cell so now we have minus 2 plus 0 j 1.5 plus 0 j 0 plus 4 j and this so it just appends 0 j because we have declared one of the variables as complex so it starts to treat all the variables inside x as complex with the zero imaginary part of course let me find out the absolute so the absolute value of uh, 0 plus 4j is 4 and it checks out okay so this is how we can find the absolute values and this is quite an important function we'll be making use of this function now and then the other important function that we'll be using is trigonometric functions like cosine sine and all this thing so let me declare this as markdown let me write over here uh, some trigonometric functions okay so let me define x as np dot cos of x uh, let me define this as b let me print b in fact let me remove the complex part for simplicity okay so x is this absolute is this b is equal to this okay so cos of so whatever the input is it, it is in radians so cos of pi so np dot pi is equal to pi is minus 1 cos of pi by 2 is something which is very small it is close to 0 cos 0 is 1 then cos 1.5 radian is this and cos minus 2 radian is this 
we can similarly find sine of x and we can find the tangent the tan okay so it's a very straightforward exercise to do okay so tan of uh, pi by 2 it's a very large number okay so for all practical purposes this is infinity you don't want it to go to nan you don't want to overflow to nan otherwise all your computations will be ruined you do need to take care of such kinds of uh, large numbers appearing in your computation and that boils down to having experience on expecting small or large numbers okay let us uh, find out some inverse trigonometric functions So let me say bi equal to np dot arc cos of x, uh, not x, b, print bi. So we've just taken whatever we have cosigned over here, we have stored it in b, and we are then taking a cos inverse of it. So we expect to get back the same x array. So in fact, let me print out x as well to just make sure it is same. And it is in fact same. Okay. So that takes care of uh, the inverse. Similarly, ci is np dot arc sine c di equal to np dot arc tan of d. So this is how you evaluate inverses. So so far, uh, what we have studied is quite easy. And uh, there is another tan inverse function. Okay, so tan inverse So it is a tan 2 in octave and all in MATLAB also you'll find this function a tan 2 and basically it takes uh, the appropriate quadrant into consideration So let us find out the inverse tangent. So np dot arc tan two minus one comma one. So let me define it to e. Let me print the value of e. Okay. So this the meaning of this function. You can double click on this and go to the contextual help. So it's x one comma x two arc tangent of x one divided by x2 okay so just have a go through this so y coordinate is the first function and the x coordinate is the second function so y is this so minus 1 it belongs to the negative y axis and x is the positive so it belongs in the fourth quadrant let me define f as np dot arc and 2 let me take both as negative okay similarly we can take both positive yeah so this is how we so basically this is pi by 4 in case uh, wondering this is pi by 4 okay so this is how we find out the appropriate arc tangent similarly there's a bunch of functions to find out the hyperbolic sines and cosines so basically a hyperbolic function so a function like cos h of x is defined as something like this so you can input latex commands inside the markdown uh, so you can render nice equations 
so this is a small uh, tip if you may so it's simple we just define g as np dot sign h of whatever you want and you can pass arrays to this so like we've done for these functions we've passed down arrays we've passed down x so the all these values of x were fed into the function cos and we obtained the corresponding array which corresponds to the cos of each element similarly we can do this over here so let me define y as np dot um, array minus 2 minus 1 1 2 something like this suppose so let me do uh, ys np dot sign h uh, say y print ys in fact let us confirm whether sign h is uh, exponential of x minus exponential of minus x by 2 so let me say ys p1 ys part 1 is np dot exponential of y ys p2 is np dot exponential of minus y and ys2 equal to one half times ys p1 plus ys p2 let me print ys and let me print ys2 so this has to be a negative sign over here okay so they are indeed the same so this is how you can find out sign h so there's a bunch of functions hyperbolic sine cos tan okay there's also inverse hyperbolic functions arc cos h arc sin h arc tan h okay so this is how you do it let us uh, look at finding out the conjugate So let us define c as 2 plus 3j so let us then define uh, let, let, ra rather let us print abs of c let us see what it is 3.6055 in fact let us confirm whether it is true so square root of 2 square plus 3 square okay so it, it does match it's not surprising that it matches i mean i just wanted to show you that it does match so what about the real part so let us print np dot real of c so it is 2 np dot imaginary of c there you go similarly we can find out the conjugate of c so print np dot conj of c so it is 2 minus 3j in fact whatever functions we are writing for the complex numbers they are equally valid if you apply it for an array so let us define uh, d equal to np dot array 2 plus 3j 1 minus j 4 plus pi j so you cannot just write j you have to always write 1 j okay because j it can be a different variable it can be a loop counter for example so you don't want to do that you want to avoid writing j as a naked term you want to always write it 1 j to signify it's a complex number so let us print d in this case so j is not defined great so this has to be 1j so now we have a complex number so let us say d conjugate is equal to np dot conj of d so let me print what dc is so it is the conjugate of 2 plus 3j which is 2 minus 3j conjugate of 1 minus 1 minus j 1 plus j and so on so this is how you can broadcast the functions to the entire array in fact it can be broadcast to an entire matrix as well it's an element wise operation it's broadcasted it's set to broadcast all over the elements of the array or the matrix so now let us move on to something 
which you will use heavily in the course of uh, this entire course or for that matter your research work and that is plotting of functions okay so let us import the appropriate library for it or, or the module for it so plotting let us import matplotlib so in fact if you want to make line plots or xy plots or in fact two dimensional plots the submodule pyplot is sufficient for your needs so import matplotlib dot pyplot and we want to import it as an alias plt okay so this is how you import matplotlib but once you have uh, imported it typically what i do is something like this i set the rc params so there is something which there's a parameter file inside matplotlib which sort of dictates how the feel of the plot is you don't need to do anything about it usually but it's just to make plots appear slightly pretty so we have plt.rc params dot update and inside this we have a bunch of parameters so the first parameter is text dot use text and we set it to be true all right then yeah that's it i mean this is the important parameter yeah you don't need to really tweak with anything else Apart from this, uh, for showing the plots inline, okay, we'll be using inline plotting in this particular notebook. So, in order to perform inline plots, we will use this config inline backend dot figure underscore format, and we'll set it to SVG. So, it's scalable vector graphics. So, we evaluate the cell, and now we are ready to plot. Now suppose we want to plot uh, sin x or cos x or whatever we have. So let us first define x. So let us define x equal to np dot lin space minus two to two in hundred steps. So this is the lin space command that we have seen earlier. Then we will define. We'll do it in the same cell. We'll define y equal to np dot cos of 2 pi times x. So now we evaluate the cell. Let us go over here. Let us do plt dot plot x comma y. And in fact, let me label this function as We'll set a level as cos x. So let's see what it returns. It takes a while initially. Yeah, there you go. So this is the plot. Okay. So plot of cos x. Now I want to label the x and y axis. So I will say plt dot x label and I label it as x. And the reason why I'm putting things under double dollars is that I'm rendering the text in latex. So latex, uh, latex if you like, is a rendering or it's a typesetting software or a typesetting program where you can render mathematics much more easily than anything else so there's a various there's a very specific syntax to render latex and you have to put mathematics within dollars so the reason why i'm using two dollars over here is the escape character backslash it doesn't get accepted in python unless you put two backslashes so let me write plt dot y level and don't worry too much about this you'll get the hang of it once you start using it and say plt dot legend
so the legend is placed over here it is the function cos x that is being plotted and this is the function and on the y axis we have y as the label we can in fact put a title to this fun, uh, this plot as well plt dot title some functions plotted okay it shows a title over here as well now we can add more plots to this we can say z equal to np dot sign 2 times np dot pi times x then inside this we can add another plot so plt dot plot x comma z label is sine of x so it should now plot two plots yeah? so the blue one is cos x and the orange one is sine x so then we can we can similarly um, we can plot as many functions as we like suppose uh, suppose now i plot tan x on this suppose i plot tan x on this in fact i can directly do the plotting without declaring it to a variable i can do it in line like this okay I, I don't need to declare it as a variable every time so the label to this will be tan of x okay so what's the error ah, it should be label equal to Okay, so now the tan x function because it becomes infinite at uh, pi by 2 so now we we want to reduce the y limit of this entire plot so how do we do that so right now it's blowing up at pi by 2 at minus pi by 2 so we, had, we need to restrict the y lim limit so plt dot y lim and within bracket we'll say minus 1 to 1 okay so then it restricts it restricts the plot between minus 1 to 1 in the y axis similarly if you if you want to only plot 0 to 2 we could have done plt dot xlim 0 to 2 okay and by default it's using a, a color switcher each time you add a plot it will switch colors between the plot but i can change the line style as well okay before the label i just need to specify something like this so now it will plot cos x as a broken line there you go it's it's plotting it as a broken line you can have a dot dash line as well something like this you can have a single dot you can plot only the dots okay so there's various line styles that you can plot and I, I request you to have a look online because the matplotlib documentation is quite exhaustive. It's quite large uh, and it's not something which we really need to discuss in great details because all we care about is to plot whatever we want to. It's to get a feel. It's not to make something pretty as, as of now. Eventually, when you start working on a research problem, you will try to make plots as descriptive as possible. So. I request you to start looking up the documentation and you eventually you'll you'll get the hang of it so let us now see how we can plot some special functions using python in particular we'll be plotting the bessel function so first of all let us see how the bessel function looks like or rather let us go just have a look I mean, okay so this is the plot we are targeting so j0 j1 j2 so j is the bessel function of the first kind and 0 1 2 they are the orders of the bessel function so let us try to recreate this particular plot so first of all let me create a markdown cell So the reason why I'm calling it special function is because in Python these are all included in the module called as SciPy. So SciPy is a, is a is an abbreviation for scientific Python and it contains a bunch of uh, tools which you will find immensely useful for scientific computation. So let us go ahead and import SciPy dot special as sp.
and so once we do that we can double click on this special and we can look up the contextual help to see all the functions that that are available to us to plot or rather to use so we have the array functions elliptic functions elliptic integrals bessel function so in particular we will be interested in jv so jv is the bessel function of the first kind of real order and complex argument this Hankel functions, the zeros of Bessel functions. So there's a whole bunch of functions that are available and you can see all those in the contextual help. So let us proceed. Let us define first the domain over which we want to evaluate the Bessel function. So x equal to np dot lin space 0 to 10. Let y be sp dot jv and this will be say 0 comma x so this is the order of this bustle function of the first kind and x is the domain over which you want to evaluate so let us go ahead and do a simple plot so plt dot plot x comma y let us let us see what this gives so there you go this is the zeroth order bessel function of the first kind so let us put some labels so plt dot x label and this will be x plt dot y label that will be j underscore zero in this particular case so, so now let us try to plot various orders through a loop okay so once x is defined we don't really want to do anything with with that so let, let me just copy this uh, copy this piece of code so that how to plot a single function is available to you later on as well so let me define a for loop so for i in np dot a range so 0 comma 4 so that we go from 0 1 2 3 okay so y will be defined in the loop itself so i need to indent it with respect to the for remember that anything anything that is indented is inside the for loop then we'll plot this so the y labels can be outside the loop because they need to be executed only once so we don't need to indent those lines we need to plot it but we'll give them uh, a label so label equal to so for each order that we plot we need to update the label so in programming languages like c you would ideally use something called as a s printf okay so in c i would use s printf but in Python, uh, you don't need to use that. We can simply make use of a drop in. So, dollar j underscore percentage d dollar. And after this, we want to replace the percentage d with the integer i. So, another percentage sign and i. If there are multiple drop ins that you want to do, so suppose there was something like equal to percentage f for example then you would simply put a bracket and put the name of the variable that you want to plot uh, that you want to drop in in place of the percentage f in this case we don't want anything so i just do this okay so let me close the bracket so this will go in a loop for each i it will plot the corresponding Bessel, uh, Bessel function and then in the end it will create the label and in the end we want to also make the legend so plt dot legend so when we run this it just shows Okay, this should be only 
Uh, so we have only uh, we forgot to substitute this zero by i because it went into the loop each time it just put zero. So this is a classic mistake because we are using we are trying to convert we are trying to reuse the code that we have already written. So don't make that mistake. So we need to substitute that zero by an i so that every time we go in the loop we have a new i and we make a new plot. Okay, great. So this is the this is how the function looks like. We don't need dollar over here. Great. So let us go to what the plot looks like. So solid line, dashed line, dashed. I mean, forget about it. So this is how you can generate the plot of Bessel function as shown in Wikipedia. And we've done it for J0, J1, J2, and J3. And you can practically plot any function you want. Uh, we've seen in the contextual help a bunch of functions that are available to us. But apart from plotting, these, these Bessel functions are very important for problems which involve cylindrical polar coordinate systems. These, appears, these, these appear as solutions to many of those differential equations. So while I'm just showing you some of the functions available in the scipy.special submodule, they do have a very deep physical meaning and that is why they're included as special functions. Now in this particular plot, uh, we see that the extent of the y-axis is from minus 0.4 to 1, while the extent of the x-axis is from 0 to 10. But the scale of the x-axis, so it goes from 0 to 10, it looks this big, while the y-axis goes from minus 0.4 to 1, and it looks, it's, it's much more magnified than the x-axis, meaning one unit on the x-axis is not equal to one unit on the y-axis so in order to show the true aspect ratio of the plot we can do the following we can first of all query the axis so we can say ax equal to plt dot gca so gca is an abbreviation for get current axis so once we have the object ax we can set the various properties of ax so ax dot set aspect and we have to put a number over here so if we put one it means the scale of the y-axis divided by the scale of the x-axis is equal to one so let's see what happens so once we do that we see that now one unit on the y-axis is equal to exactly one unit on the x-axis but now the plot is too compressed for our liking let me make it two so the y-axis is scaled uh, twice as compared to the x-axis so by doing this we can draw attention to some of the features that may otherwise be visibly absent in the plot okay and this is quite useful to show various things like boundary layers and all and people use this in their research all the time okay it's important to show the true or the, or the appropriate scale of the plot okay so this is how you can set the aspect ratio it can be a fraction as well it can be 2.5 as well So this is how you can set the aspect ratio. So what is a function? It takes some input parameters, it does some operations on the input parameters and it gives as an output some meaningful results. You ideally want to abstract whatever is going on inside the function you want to keep it to yourself because suppose you give it to someone else he just wants to use your function to get some output he doesn't really have to rewrite or relook re into the program every time okay so a way of encapsulating this idea is to make your own function so function is defined in the following manner so def so then the name of the function so suppose the name of the function is uh, circ properties okay it's a very cliched thing so the input to circ properties would be r then we click on colon and then we press enter so now automatically we are indented so whatever we write inside this block this indented block 
will be a part of the function so uh, let us define area is equal to np dot pi times r squared and circumference will be 2 np dot pi times r and we want to return area and circle we evaluate this cell so it does nothing it just stores that definition of the function in the memory so now suppose i say a comma c equal to circ properties so let r be equal to 1 when we evaluate this cell let us print a and c so a is the area so pi r square so pi times 1 square and the circumference will be 2 pi r so it checks out so we have input one uh, parameter into the function and we've out obtained two outputs so suppose instead of giving these two as so we are, we are assigning the return values of the circ properties into two variables okay here whatever is defined inside this block so these are known as local variables and their scope so the variable scope is only limited to the definition of the function meaning at the moment you make this function call it will take this value 1 it will temporarily store it in a variable called as r so the, there will be no variable uh, called as r otherwise so if we try to print r so there is no there is no variable called r so the, all this r is it's a local set of variables which is temporarily clear, created to do whatever computation you want inside similarly area circ so all these are also temporary fun, uh, temporary variables they don't really exist after the function has been called okay so this is very important so the scope of variables inside a function they remain local so you can write a big chunk of uh, logic whatever you want to define inside you define it whatever computation you want to do you compute it and then you return only the things you want to return to the main file whatever has been created inside is destroyed once the parameters have been passed back to the main file okay so a and c get these values similarly we could have assigned everything only to these props suppose so now props is basically so np dot shape props so it's something which contains two elements as shown by the shape so print props zero so this gives us the first return value that is area and props one it gives us the circumference okay so i can prettify this so i can say the area is So R is undefined, so obviously we have to put one over here. Okay, so this is how you can prettify the output. So this is how we can create a function. So let us create a function which will make a polynomial for us. Okay, so def all fx. It takes input as x and c. So let me create. Let me create a cell.
so let us make this particular function okay so def fx c so colon we will return x square plus c times x plus twice c okay so we evaluate the cell so now let us so in the previous example we've seen that once we can pass a single scalar to the function and we can obtain two scalars but again the function is broadcastable to all the elements of the array x so when when we define x equal to np dot lin space minus 3 to 3 we can define y is fx x comma say 1 so it will take each element of x and evaluate the function fx for all those elements of x so essentially y will take each values of x and evaluate x square plus cx plus c okay so in order to see whether that is true or not we will do plt dot plot x comma y so let's see what we obtain and there you have it so this is the curve of x square plus x plus 2 so in fact let us plot a family of curves parameterized by different c values so how to make a loop out of this okay so we go here for i in np dot a range minus 2 to 3 we indent this and we indent this by indenting these two lines we're essentially pushing those two lines inside the for loop if they are not indented respect to the for loop they will not be executed in the for loop it's unlike c programming where things inside the curly braces are a part of the loop okay in this uh, the syntax is not like that so instead of uh, x comma one we'll pass x comma i so let's evaluate the cell and these are the family of curves okay so these are all the family of curves obtained for different values of c so this is how you can make your own functions feel free to explore this you can pass arrays you can get return as arrays you, you can in, in fact you can return an array and a scalar as well so if i return exponential of c okay so then y comma e so i have to evaluate this evaluate this exponential is not defined because it is np dot exp so now if i print the value of e it will give me exponential of what will be the value exponential of 2 because the val the last value of i would have been 2 so it would have printed exponential of 2 just to verify that there you go so we can so essentially we have passed in we have uh, passed into the function an array and a scalar and we are obtaining as an output an array and a scalar so you can mix the type of variables that you can give into the function get out of the function there's no boundaries to this you can apply as much logic logic as you want okay but remember try to keep things simple don't try to over complicate functions in the end you will yourself have troubles reading your own code so now we come to the very last uh, of this particular lecture of course uh, the most important thing that you will be using in your research work or whatever is to perform file input output okay so file io so file io is means outputting some data to a file or reading some data from a file and this is incredibly useful if you're doing experiments 
where you have a bunch of data from some uh, probe or some apparatus and then you want to plot that data or post process that data or this is also useful when you're using some other programming language like c so using c to generate a bunch of uh, textual data and then you want to quickly plot it so python provides you the plotting libraries to load so not only to load the file but to plot it as well is not so trivial to plot something in C. C is more low level, you see. So, <clears throat> file IO. So, let us quickly see what arrays we have. So, print X. So, this is the X array, and let us uh, print Y. So, this is the Y array. So, let us confirm whether the shapes of uh, X and Y are the same. So, print np dot shape X print and b dot shape y so they are the same so now suppose i want to output to a file these two arrays so what i will do is np dot save text so the name of the file will be data files dot data file dot txt inside this uh, I'll output X and Y. So after running this, let us go Yeah. So it's created this data file inside the folder that we're working in. So let us open the data file. So yeah, it's the first row contains all the X data while the second row contains all the y data so it's essentially so let us load it so let us do uh, d equal to np dot load txt data file dot txt so once we've loaded this let us uh, find out the shape of what d contains so basically we had one row containing x one row containing y so now essentially D should contain two rows and 50 elements in each row. So let us see. So let us print np dot shape D. So again, it's two rows and 50 elements in each row. But that's not how we are accustomed to printing data to a file or reading. We are more accustomed to X data like this and Y data like this rather than having X data like this, Y data. I mean, it doesn't make a difference but still if you want to print it out and show it to someone you'd rather have it in a column format right so the way to do it is to concatenate the two arrays before dumping them to the text file so let, let us quickly see what concatenating means so np dot c x comma y so the function is c underscore yeah Okay, this should be in brackets. Okay, so np dot c. So if I double click on this and go to contextual help, so it translates to slicing objects along a given axis. Okay, so r and c are the two. So c is column stacking and r is row stacking. Okay, so we are using column stacking over here and we are passing into the square bracket the two variables that we want to stack so in fact let us print e and uh, look at what has happened so obviously e contains all the x elements and all the y elements and in a given row we have x and y okay so now e makes sense so now what we can do in this instead of uh, dumping x and y into the text file we will dump e into the text file so we will go over here and we will say np dot save text so data human readable okay too bad if you're a computer okay or a robot so let me run this cell let us open the file data underscore human and there you go we have all the x values and all the y values we don't need to worry about all the rows and all that so it's just a matter of concatenating everything and of course i mean you could run a loop 
loop over each element and print them out but come on that's not the way you get job done in python or in octave in octave or python you want to make as much as work possible with direct vectors or matrices in use that's how you achieve speed in such kinds of languages so with this we end this session on commonly used functions and of course this is just a very small subset of what what is actually existing but i just wanted to showcase some of the things that we will be using in this course and of course in the due course of this particular set of lectures we'll be encountering many more functions and we'll discuss about them as and when we require them so keep an eye keep an eye out on all these things so with this i end this particular lecture it's goodbye from me have a good day bye